In little over a year and a half, the free movement of people between the European Union and the UK will end. What's this going to mean for Britain? Its economy, its people, its identity. This is Roundtable with me, David Foster. Immigration, it was one of the key issues of last year's EU referendum campaign, but with free movement due to end in 2019, can the government really, as it puts it, take back control? Or will restricting border controls leave a void in the UK's economic and cultural makeup? Europe is once again building fences. One of the famous four freedoms set out in the Treaty of Rome, the free movement of people between the UK and the European Union, is coming to an end in March 2019. We want a new, informed, evidence-based EU migration policy. But post-Brexit, how can the UK remain a welcoming hub for international talent? The UK has the fifth largest economy in the world. One in nine workers is a foreign national. EU migrants have made a significant contribution to the British economy in food processing, clothes manufacturing, cleaning and IT, to name just a few industries. All this will be more difficult without free movement. And there are analysts who suggest that this diverse workforce has played a critical role in the UK's economic revolution. I think it can be safely assumed that the UK has only benefited from having access to such a large globalised pool of talent of which uh, EU citizens are uh, a big factor. You just look at the city, uh, many, many people from the EU work in the city and the city is the beating heart of this country's economy. But the prosperity seen in the United Kingdom hasn't been felt across the continent as a whole. With a widening economic gap between those living in the EU's east and those in the west. The perception that migrants pushed British people out of British jobs was a defining issue during last year's referendum. We will campaign for this country to have an Australian point-style system to decide who should come and settle in our country. Immigration had been a good thing for the UK in, in many respects, but it had got out of control and then we needed to take back control. Fourteen months after the result and the vision of a continent united is over. Come March 2019, EU nationals will no longer have an automatic right to enter and work in the UK. With the clock ticking on the UK's exit from the EU, there is confusion over what this new immigration system will look like. I think it will be very restrictive, but there's a genuine question as to whether this government is still going to be in power a year from now, and whether or not we could see a softening of the line on immigration, perhaps a shifting of the line if there is a change of leadership in the Conservative Party, or if indeed there's another election. The Brexit result has left EU workers in the UK worried. With the government still undecided on what its negotiating position is. Although the UK is still an attractive destination for foreign workers, it is unclear how the end of free movement will change Britain. So to move freely or not, at today's round table, Deborah Annette, co-founder of the campaign Free Move Create, a musician herself, also a lawyer, she says the end of free movement could have devastating consequences for the creative industry. Eddie Dempsey's here too from the RMT Trade Union. He says it enables the exploitation of some workers. To my left, John Harbin, director at Hobbs Labour Solutions, and 
agricultural business who thinks that Brexit has magnified our immigration problems. And next to him, Linda Yu, an economist and author who says free movement negotiations with the EU could easily drag on with no conclusion. Well, we're hoping to reach some kind of conclusion today. Thank you all very much for coming on Roundtable. Linda, you first of all, as an economist, have we seen any changes since the referendum with regard to migration? I think anecdotally, obviously, it's a bit too soon. We still obviously still have free movement um, until Brexit Day in March 2019. But I think there are reports of EU migrants being less willing to come. Certainly students um, is another population where um, the perception is maybe the UK may not be as welcoming a place if you're contemplating a three-year course, for instance, that will take you beyond 2019. And also amongst um, academics. Um, there is obviously a huge number of uh, EU uh, academics working in British universities. I think for some of them, um, staying in the UK is now something they do have to think uh, twice about, and recruitment reportedly has become and a little bit harder. And of course it harder. works both ways, doesn't it? Absolutely. Talking about Brits going to the European Union, and Deborah, I know you'll come on to that in just a moment, but who feels that we are actually taking back control? I don't think we're taking back control at the moment. I think what we're seeing is a lot of instability, certainly within the creative industry sector. There is a real concern as to what's going to happen to that sector. In, in the creative industry sector, it generates about £90 billion a year, and £40 billion of that comes from the EU. That's a lot of money. That's more than the divorce settlement being talked about a couple of weeks ago. So I think... Brexit could have devastating impact and we're already seeing musicians losing the opportunity to work in the EU, EU because people prefer EU musicians rather than British musicians. Well we'll get on to the question of visas because yeah. they will be available in just a little bit but Eddie I mean you reckon this is quite a good thing? Yeah I mean we, we campaigned as a trade union for Brexit we've always been opposed to it traditionally the entire labour movement in Britain was opposed to the EU on the basis that it's a neoliberal straitjacket on uh, governments and people that want to see more socialist policies. So, for example, for us, free movement of labour is just simply a part of the single market, which was Thatcher's single market. We've been contesting Thatcherism forever. We want to see it ended. And uh, we want the opportunity in this country to be able to do things like take our industries into public ownership and to control the supply of labour. To but, prevent but the taking your skills wherever they are most needed, I would have thought mm. that was something that was, in effect, some kind of a socialist ideal as well. Well, not, it depends on how it works, you see, because... Under the free movement of labour, I mean, they're quite explicit about it. The entire thing was set up to have a wider pool of labour for employers to exploit. They want to buy as much. I don't market. think that word was in there, though, was no, it? Well, it wasn't. There's, Absolutely there's, not. Of course, they're not that silly to put that word in there, but we're not that silly to believe what they're saying either. We know exactly what it's about. And it's about creating the conditions to allow employers to have greater profits at the expense of wages. I we just want don't to think unbalance that's right. that, and we want to have Absolutely. higher wages at the, at the expense of employers' profits. If you look at the legislation that's come out of the EU, an awful lot of it has been extremely progressive. For instance, we only have the statutory right to holiday because of the EU directive. We only have protection. That's not to well, say no, we no, wouldn't have had that's, it anyway. That's not true. Absolutely. That's, that's no, you have negotiated we, collective we have, agreements we have done that's that in quite this country. different to EU and legislation. Is, working and working class organisations like the one I represent believe that we are the best people to organise and to build our rights, which we've done forever in this country, everything from the suffragette movement okay, let me, to let, the holidays let, let's move on to, to where 30, we are 35 hour week today. And uh, my and John, I know you, there was a point you wanted to make, but I want to bring up something that, that, institutions to deliver our workers that Eddie mentioned, which was the word exploitation. And you do, in the agricultural business, seasonal workers, they get paid a pittance, really. What would you consider a pittance? Well, I would say I looked at your website, £7.50 an hour with a £50 a week accommodation for seasonal workers, which takes you to the very minimal wage, minimum wage, £6.50 an hour. Most of our workers are earning in between £10 and £15 an hour. But then those aren't the jobs on your website at the moment. That is what those workers are earning. So the, we talk, you just mentioned the accommodation charge. If we had a worker working in the middle of London, would you expect them to pay more than £40 or £50 a week in accommodation? That is a, that is a, a charge that is set by the government and the um, wages board. But as I say, most of our workers earn between 10 and 15 pounds an hour in seasonal labour conditions. Would you not get Brits to do it for the money you're offering? Anybody thinks that... If there were six jobs I looked at on your front page, and each one was offering seven pounds fifty an hour. Most, most employers advertise at national living wage. Well, here's the thing. 
people, people uh, from that perspective tend to argue when they're defending stuff like zero hours contracts and insecure employment that what British workers want is flexibility. But yet when they've got flexible employment, like seasonal working that he's offering, all of a sudden British workers don't want it. They must have workers from somewhere else. Yeah, why don't they want it? Um, there's a number of reasons. Um, quite often... Because the wages are too low. That's, and the that's conditions just are rubbish. Not, uh, please. That's not true. £15 an hour is not a low wage. No. Um, conditions. We're regulated with conditions. And the work is hard. Are you questioning that... Um, British people don't want hard work. I'd probably agree. But, but John, when, when we get to the point of March 2019, those jobs are not going to be available to EU workers unless they apply for a visa to come and work in this country. So the chances are it'll either have to be people from different countries yep. or it's going to have to be the Brits. So what are you going to do? Unfortunately, we will start to see um, fruit and veg rotting in the fields because we will not have enough people to pick those crops. We're, uh, on an annual basis, our industry needs eight, around about 85,000 workers. And when do we get to the end of March 2019, we simply are not going to have those people. And that shortfall is not going to be picked up by um, UK unemployed. I suppose it's a general question. Mm -hmm. it's, it's about agriculture, it's, it's, it's about other occupations. Uh, is Brit the British economy likely to see a negative result? from this, or is it still too soon to say? <laughs> Forecasting is always very tricky. Um, but I, I think you can look back at the role that immigration has played in the British economy, and it has had a positive impact on the British economy. That's not to suggest that there aren't distributional impacts within the British economy as to how different types of workers have been affected um, by the EU free movement um, policy. But on the whole, if you take the economy as a whole, it benefits from immigration. For one, it keeps our aging society less aged. Um, that's one thing we share in common with the <coughs> Americans. Um, so I think, but I think coming to the point about whether British workers can fill the void, I think that is one of the big issues. There are several things being talked about for seasonal workers. One is, can you get um, British workers, and the unemployment rate right now is very low, it's less than 5%, are there British workers to take those jobs? It's the lowest in 40 plus years. Yes, that's right. And so the economy, um, you can argue there aren't a lot of um, workers mm -hmm. there to take the jobs. And then secondly, um, any immigration regime that we will come out with after Brexit will include a visa regime for EU as we currently have for non-EU citizens and low-wage workers, it's very difficult Which leads for us, them to apply to leads come us rather in. rather nicely so. to a campaign that you're mm -hmm. launching and a campaign that you would like to see, which is um, visa waivers for seasonal workers and yep. the ability to go and work in the European Union on the same terms as I've just mentioned, that without, without visas. Absolutely. How's that going? Well, we kicked it off about a month ago. It's going extremely well. It's not just for musicians, it's for anybody who works in the creative industries. And we need to remember that most of those people are freelancers. So they don't see the UK as the number one place to get work. They actually see Europe as the number one place to get work. And definitely our musicians, most of them, spend most of their time going to Europe, sometimes up to 40 times a year in order to work. And they absolutely need the ability to be able to travel to Europe without having to get a visa, because it's very often a quick gig that comes up at the last minute. It's not like a seasonal worker. It's not like a train driver. It comes up last minute. They need to be able to get on a train Well, then I'm going to put the same, same question to gig. John. Then I'll come back to you, Eddie, and ask what you think about this. You, you want uh, uh, visa waivers for seasonal workers. As, as an industry, we would like to see a uh, seasonal agricultural workers or temporary workers scheme for both EU nationals and probably non-EU nationals. Because at the end of the day, if we don't have these people, we will have fruit and vegetables going to waste. And we don't want to see our fruit and vegetables imported from the EU, which is also a strong possibility. But you know, one of the first stories I reported on when I moved into television 30-plus um, years ago was about fruit and veg workers in, in Worcestershire who were being employed illegally mm -hmm. on the black market. And, and that's what we're going to see otherwise, isn't it? I certainly hope not. Um, they'll, just, yeah. they'll just come into this country somehow. They, they could be paid very little money. Uh, they could be kept in terrible Ex conditions. Exportation is, is yeah. unfortunately... That's why you need a really strong employment law regime, <coughs> which the state enforces through things like the minimum But we've wage. had one of those. We yeah. had, we had a seasonal agricultural workers scheme. Place. We counted people in, yeah. we counted people out. These yeah. weren't people that wanted to remain within the UK. They wanted to work here 
earn good money, take that money home to support their family and friends at home. So, so you are lobbying, you are lobbying, they yep. all want exceptions, Eddie. Yeah, of course they do, because they want access to cheap labour. That's, that's what the employers want. And I just, want to pick up, I just want to pick up on a point that was made about this being a debate on immigration. EU free movement of labour isn't immigration. It's a specific type of... Um, it's it's a, a specific part of the single market to have a wider labour pool for employers to use. So, for example, immigration is you move to another country, you throw your lot in there, you become a citizen, you stay there, and all the rest of it. The EU free movement of labour is something different. It's where people come, like in his industry, to work for a defined period of time, often on lower wages than are offered to workers in that host country. country. They often go back and they often live here without even full citizen, citizenship rights. And how it works specifically, if you take the case of Viking Lines, which is a Finnish shipping com uh, company, they had a ship called the Rosella, where the company decided to import workers from Estonia on a lower wage than the Finnish workers on, them, on those ships. The trade unions took up uh, attempted a strike to enforce their national collective bargaining agreed rate of pay for all workers on okay. that ship. And it was challenged because it set the EU, uh, the ECJ ruled that it infringed on EU free movement of labour and the right to establishment. Yeah. And that is what it was designed for, for employers to bring relations. workers okay, from one place cases to drive I'm down sure terms and conditions in another. That's you, what it's but I, I want to ask you about it's in, not in general. The, as far as a lot of people can see, your reason position is not one of... Um, trying to sort of end exploitation is one of protectionism mm. uh, for people that you represent. Yeah. Well, on top of that, I want to see a planned economy. So you can't do that if you just leave an entire section of the economy to the whims of the market driven by economic forces through those institutions. I don't so think do you want to stop our British music musicians going overseas and getting good, good gigs so that they can spread their remarkable talent around the world? Are you against music? No, I don't think, oh, I don't think, on, I don't think on, anyone's don't suggesting that. What I, suggesting against, that. what I am yeah, against is employers able to bring in workers from poorer countries in Europe in like some of the uh, factories and some of the, the uh, distribution centres we've got in the UK, employ them for six months on low wages, destroy all trade union organisation and bring wages down there, and then send them back home when they've been okay. used up. Eddie, let, let, let me put against. this to you. I mean, it, it's, it is inevitable, isn't it, in some cases, or, or could we possibly see a dilution of this so that we get a multitude of exceptions mm. and what Eddie wants to see doesn't actually happen? My guess is there's going to be a, a formulation of a new visa system which will have exceptions. I think that's almost <coughs> inevitable. No system is ever going to mm -hmm. suit such a complicated economy and most countries do have a system which is tilted towards what they want. So for instance, if you look at highly skilled workers, Canada has an immigration system that favors highly skilled workers. So the visa system as designed will not be neutral. So the question is whether it's musicians mm -hmm. or seasonal workers or um, some of the sectors, the, the kind of what I would consider mid-skilled uh, sectors, um, those I think will all lobby the government to produce a visa system that works for them. One danger of this, of course, is that we are not going to have a visa, a visa system in place um, anytime right. soon because this is a complicated set of negotiations and it's a complicated, diverse economy. And I think that's where you get some of the uncertainty, some of the messiness mm. around Brexit when we, are after, when we do end free movement, if that does happen without an implementation or transition period, whatever the latest euphemism is for any transition to what, implementation to what, but anyways, chances are um, by March 2019 we won't have such a system in place and it needs to be separately negotiated um, okay. within any transition what free movement will be. Kick in anybody, but this is directed um, immediately at Eddie. Do you believe anybody who says that we are collectively going to be worse off if we stop this? No, because when people say we're better off and the economy's doing well, that doesn't paint the correct picture. You should always ask better for who, because you can have a growing economy with the GDP going up, but the major share of the wealth in this country isn't going to normal people. It's not going to workers, regardless if GDP is going up or not. It tends to be going to people at the top of the corporation. Which is a different argument altogether. I'm asking specifically about ending free movement of people. We, a lot of people suggest we're going to be worse off. I don't you think you we're say going to be bunker? worse off. Or at least working class people aren't going to be worse off. I think the employers are going to be worse <coughs> off because they're going to be in a weaker bargaining position when it comes to wages. And that's what I want to say. Well, actually, may, may trickle down to you because if, they haven't, if they've got to spend more money bringing in seasonal workers or <coughs> whatever it happens to be, your chances of a pay rise uh, they, are They don't spend smaller. more money bringing them in. They bring them in and they're able to avoid their responsibilities to the people here. So they don't 
put any money into training people here. They don't take up any of the unemployed people in this country. And he's that's going to change? If he, he's just said, you know, British workers don't want hard work. No, they do want work. What they want is decent wages in terms of conditions. Could you tell and me? And they want the ability to post -Brexit, bring people in here to who's Who are going to pick our crops? Mm -hmm. what's, what's wrong with people here? We haven't got enough of them. Haven't we? We've got 5% of the economy that's unemployed. OK. Pay better wages and you'll get the workers. So you tell me... So, so you let me come and negotiate the rate of pay for your, for your industry, and I guarantee I'll fill your vacancies for you. Right. So let's look at Kent. So Kent has one of the lowest unemployment rates in the UK. And let's go to somewhere like Bradford or Hull, which has some of the highest um, unemployment rates. How on earth do I get people from Hull and Bradford and the places of high spot unemployment to go to Kent or to go to Hereford and Worcester to pick fruit and vegetables? Six days a week, starting at four o'clock in the morning, finishing at two o'clock in the afternoon, these guys have got families. Logistically, it just does not work. But you're already yeah, providing accommodation for, for foreign workers. Couldn't Europe, you though, say to it? the people in Bradford, come on, we've got a house for you down here? Well, it's not a house. It's caravan accommodation. These are like villages of caravans. Exactly. Shanty towns. Shanty that's towns for just... workers brought in from halfway across the world. And you're saying it's a problem to bring people... But that's if somebody's, not, a job, if somebody's not got a job elsewhere, wouldn't they come down and then live in, presumably, their, their sanitary, these, these caravans? Absolutely. Well, why, why wouldn't they come and work down there? They'd be more than welcome to do so, but how, how logistically <coughs> do we get people's um, families? They're, they're integrating into an Eastern European population because we would have to get the, the domestic workers to integrate into maybe 800 or 1,000 people on any one site. Is our culture going to change? Yes. And if it does, for better or worse? I think Deborah. we're going to be much the poorer. Certainly, I think the UK has always prided itself on its cultural industries, things like our music, our theatre, our visual arts. And I think if we end up with a very restrictive form of cultural exchange, we're going to end up much the poorer in terms of our country. And I'm not talking about GDP. I'm talking about creativity, what it is to be a human being. And even, you know, your spirituality as a person, all of that's going to be adversely affected. Culturally, good or bad? Well, I think, you know, I'm from London. I grew up in New Cross in Ditford. It's always been a very sort of um, culturally diverse place. Most, you know, most of the people I grew up with were from places that weren't EU countries. It's a very rich place to grow up in. Culture's always been very, very, very sort of like fluid in Britain, and it, it always will be. So you don't think don't, it's going no to No one's change. talking about closing... This isn't going to close the doors on Europe as if no one's going to come here when we leave the EU free movement and of, of uh, Labour area. There's still going to be immigration. People's still going to come here. People's still going to mix. We're still going to have a vibrant culture. It just means we're going to redress the balance where employers have got a buyer's market at the moment. It might take some of the, some of the uh, wind out of their sails. If not economically, then worse off in another way, perhaps. Well, we've seen a crop off of around about 20% of workers that we can't recruit for. And the reason for that is that Britain is seen as a xenophobic and racist country. Mm. That's unwelcoming. Mm. Mm. And that's where we're headed. <coughs> yeah. Is that a perception that's put out there by the media? Because maybe five years ago we weren't seen as such, and suddenly overnight we became xenophobic, we became unwelcoming. We didn't like foreigners. Well, that's, that what, change, that, that's what our workers that are telling us. Well, they, they told us when Brexit happened, what was going to happen was UKIP was going to be on the march, everyone was going to become xenophobic, the Tories were going to be empowered, and we said all along, UKIP will be wiped out, the Tories will be divided and broken up, and that's exactly what's happening. And but I don't see this big... I don't see people in this big xenophobic rise at all. Well, what I, I do think see you're is the wrong. Tories in you disarray. Need to come and look I see at the my Labour industry. Party on the march, ready to take power at any moment, and I see UKIP wiped out. And I, I think, think that's good news. Very... Which, 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 if and I thank just God, there's something happening for a change. We've had 30 ne years of neoliberalism. It's about time that was broken, and I'm glad to see it happen. Let, let me put this one to Linda, and of course, you, mm -hmm. can, all, you can all chip in. Um, in, in terms <coughs> of the most vital industries we have in this country, and I wouldn't necessarily call the health service an, an industry, mm -hmm. but if we lose. EU workers from that, what is going to happen? What's going to happen if we lose them from, from the railways? What's going to happen if we lose them from the service industries, where you get your coffee, where, where people get their houses clean, where, where builders come in, and what is going to happen? Probably um, two things. I mean, one is it gets filled by non-EU migrants if the labour market is as tight as um, it might be in certain segments. Um, or secondly, robots? <laughs> I mean, let's not forget, automation is a massive threat anyways mm. to mechanised jobs. Which is and one thing so I was going to put to John about the, the jobs <laughs> rotting in the field. Why not get machines to do it? Because um, the soft fruit, it will use, we'll use soft fruit as a, as a good example, is that our strawberries grow at different times. They have different growth stages. Every one strawberry on a plant 
grows at a different speed. So that so actually needs they're to too delicate and too temperamental. That's correct. And if I could invent a strawberry picking machine today, I'd be an extremely wealthy guy. British ingenuity. I'm sure you'll come up with it. I was going to say I would enrol against that. <laughs> that would be wealthy. The, I think company. it's on the way. It yeah. is on the way, but it's certainly not. No, but it's five not five exactly. Two. It's not. It's. I, I put that out there because if we're going to talk about long-term trends, I think. Globalization, migration, that's one trend. The other big trend that's going to affect the world of work is clearly mechanization yeah. and technology. And I think these are the kind of economic forces which are being rethought. Yeah. Um, probably immigration more because of Brexit, we're debating it, but nobody really talks about what's actually happening, which is a lot of mechanized jobs, especially if you look at America, which is further along than we are. They certainly have lost a lot of um, blue collar mid skill jobs. So, whether jobs we have to Europeans coming in here to work or whether we have people from other nationalities on a, on a point system, it's all, all sort of irrelevant because our and lives are going to be taken. I, <laughs> I wish we had. It'll be the I long run. <laughs> I was just going to say that's why we need to support the creative industries because mm. that is much less at risk of automisation. Thank you, thank you, thank you all very much for coming on, on round table. It was, as you've seen, an issue which uh, uh, drew up the battle lines for the referendum and for the discussion around this table. Some say divisive, some say polarising. Uh, the British are, it's fair to say, still split over it all. In 18 months, though, the free movement of EU citizens to the UK and back the other way is probably going to end. And transition period or not, whatever that means, that's going to signal the beginning of a very different United Kingdom. On that, I think we are all agreed. Thanks for watching Roundtable. From me, David Foster, and the rest of the team, see you next time. Bye-bye.